Actually, I thought about dressing up for this one. Um, one of the ones I posted over the weekend, one of these videos, uh, I got a message from somebody, somebody out there, uh, responding, um, I would let you rule me in the bedroom anytime. And which is like water in the desert. Uh, so um, whoever that is, if you're a female, um, I think it would be even more fun if uh, we traded off who gets to be the ruled and who gets to be the ruler. Um, I guess politics is sexy because I'm not anymore, but I thought I'd just show you what I looked like when I was 21. I don't know if this will show up, but that's what I looked like when I was 21. This is what I look like now. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Um, but uh, I think it might be... I, I'm going to read something of my mother's. My mother wrote this in 1973. Um, it doesn't deal with politics right now. Well, it does, uh, well, it doesn't deal with the specific political issues that I'm trying to raise right now. But um, this is what my mother wrote back in 1973. The title of this is called, Are Men Necessary? One summer evening, not long ago, a dear companion suddenly waved a red flag at me. We were slouched on the sofa in a local jazz club, lazily listening to the Dixieland band when he leaned over to me and casually, ob casually observed that women exist for the pleasure of men. My instant response surprised me. I snapped out that I exist for the pleasure of me. That seemed to end the matter. The, vehement, the vehemence of my response led to a startling line of thought. Looked at from the opposite perspective, his remark was quite valid. For all practical purpose, men truly do exist at the pleasure of women. Centuries ago, female infants were exposed, left to die on mountain slopes. Too many females were a liability to the societies into which they were born. They were unable to perform the heavy work essential to survival and required expensive dowries upon marriage. A few were valuable as pawns in political alliances, but the majority were clearly redundant. Today, we have reached a situation where the tide has turned and the human male is equally redundant. It is already a distinct advantage, if you are a member of the cattle family, to be born female. The frozen semen of a few bulls is quite sufficient to propagate the species, and we are all uneasily aware of the fate of the rest of the bull calves. I am not suggesting that we gentle and sensitive women would be prepared to slaughter and eat our male offspring. We wouldn't be that crude, nor would we resort to the unspeakable practice of infanticide by exposure. Science has provided elegant methods to simply genetically engineer them out of the species, a matter of Xing out the Y chromosome. I suspect that men are vaguely aware of their dilemma. They are at great pains to remind us of our need for them. They regularly reward each other for their usefulness to mankind. Consider how consistently they give each other prizes. Occasionally, occasionally they include a woman or two, a woman or two, usually one like Mother Teresa, who confines her activity to, to, to traditionally female pursuits. Given the basic operational definitions of our world, all of them designed by men, there isn't the slightest reason to retain their services. We do not require, require them to survive physically, and there is not a function left for them to perform that we can't do as well or possibly better for ourselves. Thinking in terms of the logic that men are so fond of, in which, and in which we, of course, are singularly lacking, they are unnecessary. They have admirably supplied the technology which has reduced them to the status of amusing anachronisms. Some of the cleverest ones have even been thoughtful enough to put their sperm in cold storage, thus freeing us of concern with selection of the fittest. They have admitted us to all of their hallowed precincts, 
precincts wisely howling all the time. There are now ample women trained in all of their special skills, eminently capable of training women to fill out their ranks. How clever the so-called so backward peoples are to keep their distaff populations behind the veil. Barefoot and pregnant, ignorant and untrained, they can't possibly conceive their power. Archaeologists know that the ancients chose female deities. The mechanics of sex were unknown, and the fact that women produced babies appeared to endow them with a magical power that men lacked. Men found, men found it politic to invent some wonderful myths to make themselves feel, feel important. Chief among these was the notion of the crucial importance of physical strength and the introduction of a limited god with a definite masculine bias. His rules and regulations require the interpretation and active intervention of exclusively male priests. We gradually came to prefer the ones who had little, or better yet, nothing to do with women. They created a devastating fairy tale about a lady named Eve, which convinced us of our perfidy. We stood branded with nothing less than responsibility for the eviction of our entire species from paradise itself. The next step was the elevation of the mother of this god to a pedestal of such virginal perfection, such manifest holiness, it kept us striving after a model forever out of reach. We gave in, surrendered our magic, and let them run the world. Until now. Think of all the troubles they bring us, the advantage of a manless world. No more sticky problems with abortion. Conception would be free of any possibility of, of, uh, of error. The bishops wouldn't have to sit around discussing the merits of birth, birth control. There wouldn't be any bishops and birth would be strictly controlled. No more hassles about sex education in the, in the schools. Sex would be a matter for science to deal with in a very rational fashion. War would be out, passe. Everyone knows that women are more verbal. They would merely refuel the coffee urn and talk the problem to death. God knows they never do anything. It takes a man to get things done. Aggression is one of their distinguishing features. We have all sorts of research to attest to that. Something or other to do with testosterone levels. At the very worst, Mrs. Thatcher would stop speaking with Indira, Indira Gandhi. The oil shortage would be over. Women only care about the color of their cars and whether they have style. They don't actually drive them much. Since we are so small, we seldom need great big ones to enhance our egos. What about the population explosion? Just under one half of the prop, pop, uh, just under one half of the problem solved in one fell swoop. Nothing messy or drastic, just let them die off like the buffalo. For those of us who take pleasure in sex, we could save back a few. The ones who are good at it, who remember to shave and learn not to snore. Not enough to cause any trouble. They bond together, you know. Before you knew it, they'd be scheming again, forgetting their place. If all this seems a little extreme, consider the precedents. God does not select for the cow, man does. What might he do when he finds a way to an incubate, a incubate a baby outside of a womb? His track record with animals is not very encouraging. Species after species has dwindled, the end dramatically justifying the means. Hadn't we better get them before they get us? And by the way, in 2006, Maureen Dowd wrote a book with the same title. It took the feminist movement over three decades to catch up with my mother. <laughs>